modify food crops through the alteration of genes. This makes crops more resistant to disease and pests and also results in higher yields. Those who favor genetically modified crops insist that they are the best bet for Indian farmers, while those opposed to them maintain that the introduction of such foodstuffs will endanger the biodiversity of the country. Those in favor argue that the critics of genetically modified foods are working at the behest of the Western farming lobby, afraid of competition from Indian farmers, and those in opposition maintain that the supporters of genetically engineered crops are working for the multinational seed companies. To discuss which group is right, we have in studio Professor C.S. Prakash, Director of the Center for Plant Biotechnology Research at the Tuskegee University, and Dr. Vandana Shiva, Director of the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology. We will start with you, Dr. Shiva. How would you respond to this charge that you're working for the interests of the Western farming lobbies? Unfortunately, it is the genetic engineering group that is working for the global corporations. That's the way the technology is organized. It is patented. Even when the public sector does enter, it works on terms that are totally dependent. But you're not asking the question I asked you. Are you working for the Western farming lobbies? I will ask them what they are working for. Not at all. I work for myself and I try my best to serve Indian peasants, especially those who are at that vulnerable situation where any increasing cost of inputs, whether it is seed or chemicals or patent royalties and technology fees, will push them even further over the brink than they, we are already seeing them. The suicides, the kidney sales are already indicators we, that we'll our farming that. communities now, are now, in a crisis. Now let me ask him the question. Are mm -hmm. you working for the multinational seed company? Uh, no, not at all. I work for myself and for my university. And uh, I personally feel that uh, this technology is so pro farmer and so somebody who is working for the peasants should allow for the choice for the farmers to decide for themselves. Well, why is it pro farmers? Because this is a technology that specifically favors and helps, has so much potential improve their livelihood and bring in uh, increased food production, bringing in an element of profitability. More than anything, this is a choice uh, that, uh, that the farmers want. Now, you disagreed with that view because you said the costs are going to go up. The costs are already going up. Uh, the, the replacement of farm seed, seed or public sector supplied seed uh, by hybrids has already shot up the price of the seed itself and of the inputs associated with it. In the case of genetically engineered seed, the costs will be even higher. And all comparisons to date are in the context of large industrial farms of the United States. In the case of India, the GE packet is a costly packet, high cost package, and unlike what is claimed, it is not in any case, whether it's Roundup resistant or herbicide resistant crops, which do require by their very nature herbicides associated with the crop. And in the case of so-called pest resistant crops, the pest resistance is for a short time to one specific family of pests, the bollworm. All the other pests require spraying. Sure, uh, that is fine, but bull cotton bollworm that you mentioned is the single largest pest of which farmers spray about eight or nine of the 12 sprays they do on cotton, they do it on that. So if the farmer has to spray only three, make only three sprays instead of 12, what is wrong in that? And so it is again a choice of the farmer uh, that, that he has to make whether to go for that or to, to keep using the pesticides. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first charge. Let me address to the, the, the second charge. What was the, the second the, uh, the, the costs are going to be high. Yeah. Costs are going to be high and again this is a choice that the farmer has to make. We had the same arguments for the hybrid seeds. I come from Bangalore where we have this uh, excellent seed uh, company there, Indo-American hybrid seeds, that sells hybrid uh, tomato and amongst other things. And that day, and they release their tomato seeds, you could see the farmers lining up in the, and waiting all night to buy their seeds. And they, sp they give a, spend a lot of money to buy the seeds. Why? Because farming is a, a profession, it's not a vocation. So, so, so if you're they have saying to even if the costs are high, the profits are also exactly. high. Exactly, they make they 10 the times more. High. The farmers are not stupid. Uh, it is, it's high time we started uh, relegating our farmers to the role of, you know, they're gullible, incompetent. They need some environmentalist green from, from the big urban cities to protect them against the clutches of this thing. Now, I don't no, think no, any no, farmer no, would agree no, that. No, let her but it was the Indian farmers who uprooted the first trials of Bolgard cotton. I it was no green, it was no environmentalist, it was farmers of Karnataka and farmers it of It was the farmers who were growing it. Organized themselves. It was the, fa it it was was the farmers themselves. That is a it violent uh, 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 thing the, on the part no, of this certain was one by one. This one was in response one one. Your, to your saying that they, yes, they don't need protection, they're, they're making up their own minds. But 
First of all, Bolgard is not the dominant pest, even for cotton around Bolgard, the world. In yes. Australia, it is not. And in fact, in Australia, just but, because... But what about India? In, in India, the point is the other pests are starting to build up huge resurgences. There's even in the United States news that new pests are emerging. Uh, we have data that the Bt cotton and Bt crops are starting to affect beneficial species, which destroys the pest predator balance and therefore creates new problems for pest management. And in South Africa, where I've been recently, the farmers are being asked to plant only 30% of their fields under Bolgard because 70% has to remain under conventional cotton just to manage resistance in bollworm because the data is accepted by Monsanto, by EPA in the yeah, US, the that there is huge rapid resistance, more as the chemical no. insecticide. Faster. So this is, a, this is, this is a, No, look, you, people are saying the same thing four years ago when we started planting cotton in the United States. We have 40 million acres planted under cotton and not a single incidence of pest buildup has come about. And because of the refugia management, and just because the pests are going to build up, are you going to deny the Indian farmers a viable opportunity and a chance that they would be able to cut down on their pesticides and make more profit out of going no, from why it does not cut down on the pesticides when you compare it to ecological organic farming it does not and as far as the yield claim of what? genetic engineering is concerned around the world and especially us the data on yield rack from inde independent assessments all no, data no. of increased yields comes from the companies themselves who hold secret trials never let no. it be transparent to date the indian trials are secret no, we have yes, no one one the one back. One he is representing a university over here not a seed company but no but the interesting no. thing is dr prakash's university is the preferred university by usda to deploy this technology in the third world they have a huge grant to do this job they are coming out as agents of the USDA and just last week and the USDA, USDA is not a company though. and the last yes la, last week USDA was requested by its own advisory committee to back out of the patent on the terminator technology no. which it holds and the USDA has turned down the advice of its own advisory committee of about I, 30 I'm members. in that committee and yeah. that is not true. It is I, true. No, I'm in that committee. <laughs> so I would know I'm one of the advisors uh, in that. But secondly, uh, in terms of the, the coming back to the access to the technology of farmers, why are we trying to be anti-farmer here, trying to deny a technology that can make an overwhelming uh, uh, impact on the lives? of the 80% of the people in this country. A technology, the science is not the issue here. You can talk about the pest resistance and other things. A every scientific body that has looked Dr. at it here has said that this is as safe a technology as any other technology. And so uh, what we are doing is not, much larger. that not, we have to take a short commercial break. We'll okay. be back, you're watching Crossfire, <laughs> and we're discussing the position of these two groups of people about the genetically modified crops being introduced into India. Don't go away, stay with us, we'll be back soon. Welcome back. You're watching Crossfire and we are discussing the introduction of genetically modified seeds into Indian agriculture with Dr. Vandana Shiva and Professor Prakash. Vandana, prior to the break, uh, Dr. Professor Prakash was referring to the fact that you are not allowing Indian farmers to make a free choice of what they want to do. We are serving the Indian farmers with information they ask us for. Indian farmers are bright, intelligent, organized. They're the backbone of this country politically and economically. And they don't need help from either Dr. Prakash or me. That's but basically, they ask us for specific information and specific support at specific times, and we are there to help them. What is the specific support you're referring to? Well, they ask us for information and analysis on GM crops, and we do it. That's what our foundation is. Scientific exists information, for. whether they are safe. We and get uh, it from around the world. We don't depend on the Monsantos. Uh, we, there are lots of independent scientists piece? around the world. Who no, uses the scientific we, information we, we, that they Greenpeace does not generate research data. 
You must understand that, Doctor. They just pick and choose what. No, uh, they, they do action. They're an activist group. They have group. every they scientific towers. agency that has looked into the the safety aspect not of everything. biotechnology. Not, not at all. All so. the most credible international, including the Indian National Academy of Sciences, and we have one of the best regulatory oversights in this country, in this in, in India, uh, for uh, the, the the release of genetically modified crops that has gone through that. And then no, we have been leading this we for have the a past Supreme five. Court. We have a Supreme Court. Yeah, case that's because, because you have put it on the no, but the, because the rules on. Uh, under the EPA were violated for the trials. And now the present uh, clearance is given in the year 2000 mm -hmm. is for seed bulking yeah. under a trial. You can't have seed bulking under a trial. You're supposed to be testing out the seed. Sure. For we have been time. growing, we have been growing this crop for the past four years stage. in the United States. 25,000 field trials have happened. And there's a Thousands of and who generates the data? No, Dr. not Bagash, just the companies. Not one publication no, 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 that is not. Right. That's reviewed. again, it not is the misinformation that we are going around. Not, I can give you true. 50 publications from independent agencies with the peer re reviewed publications talking about the safety of this. And again, you should remember the science and the expert judgment behind it. What, would, what can go wrong when, when one gene from a soybean is taken and turned around and put back? What can go wrong when you take a gene from a corn and put it into I, a soybean? I think at this point, let we me ask you a very specific question. For 10,000 years. Well, they would, Very specific yeah. question. Can you give an example of where it has gone wrong? Well, yes. Uh, uh, two, two years or three years ago, the Roundup resistant uh, cotton, the bowl started to fall off. That's because, because they of the had no heat idea. in Texas. But that's precisely it. No, that would have happened. It, no, it would it. not have. It doesn't Look, happen in Texas. Real world situation bowls don't fall off in cotton. In cotton one is supposed to hold off its bowl. In one percent of the crop. There is a lot of uncertainty in the that. technology. And in addition to that, there's so don't data, crops fail you know, here? There's Without the conventional crops, they don't fail at all? It's not failure, it's strange behavior of plant physiology. Plants in addition behave to that, we all the time we because have they the live data, in the real world. We have the data on Bt toxin impacting non-target species. That data exists in peer-reviewed journals yes. like Nature and Science. Yeah, those are the monarch and butterfly with a little laboratory study where they force fled these butterflies. In the actual fact, three but years of butterflies, butterfly numbers have in increased. There's no monarch butterflies in Switzerland. And no, well, what about mycotoxin? What about that 30-fold reduction in the cancer-causing toxin that is 30-fold less in the BT corn? Why, why don't you talk about it? Look, you can keep harping on the little nitty-gritty things about it's science all the time, but the real fact, when you take the but overall you context, know, if there was no that concern, there is the nations of the world wouldn't have negotiated for 10 years on the issue of biosafety. Well, nations of the world are also using this as an instrument for a trade protection. This is, we what, don't have to what invoke Europe. What trade protection in the third world is not producing any of these seeds at this moment? No, no, but no. It this was is the between a transatlantic war between it, Europe and America. No, the Euro Europeans and the U.S. were not the leaders in the negotiations. It was the third world. I was present in every negotiation yes, from I the beginning also. in 91 when we put in the clauses in the Convention on Biological sure. Diversity on CBD. That is fine. So but it that's is not defense. the case that, this is you know, uh, making the U.S and the Europeans the surrogate for every independent assessment and call for safety by citizens and governments of the world. No, we don't have it's to. Basically we do it. To we say are the world it, yeah. is America and Europe, and no. the world is more than that. No, India has the one of the, 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 the strictest and the most scientific biosafety it guidelines. Does, and yes. it has and been violated. violated. And we are upholding the rules that exist on the on, on the paper and, and the companies and, and the again, government. It is itself. not just the companies. Okay, and again, when I'm talking about the biotechnology for the third world and biotechnology for India, it is not just alone the companies. We have the scientific prowess uh, within the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, which in the agriculture universities and other universities, to bring out the products in the public sector. And it is not the companies alone, no, and no, companies I do have a role to but play. But meantime, the public sector is winding itself down, and you do, your seed farms are being bought yeah, up. Yeah, because I, I, of I, I, all I, the voice and all the fear I, that you are uh, well, promoting. Not at all. If, if, I, if I, I may cut in now, please, 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 It please. has nothing to do with biotech. I think, I think they're not getting any, okay. you know, anywhere with this yeah. argument, because you're saying there is, he's saying there is not, yeah. right? So, let me ask you a very simple question, right? What do you think will happen if the genetically modified crops come to India? Number one. Number two, cannot the government right, protect separately biodiversity, etc., all these you know, externalities that you're talking about, quite separately from the choice being made by the farmers? In terms of what can happen, what will happen is since biotechnology is embedded in a certain context of socioeconomic and political control, including when the technology is deployed via the public sector, the costs don't do go down. It is part of a capital intensive package compared to a but low profitability? profitability is not more because at this point 
the crops are being rejected worldwide, wherever farmers, whether it's United States or Brazil, wherever farmers have planted GE, they're getting no markets. Even in India, the soya farmers came to us and said, please keep no, GE no, okay, in, uh, I, I, in I, I India GE free it, because please, they, let's the, move on the, to the premium next question. is not on GE. People are rejecting. And if you're looking for farmers responding to markets, the markets for GE don't exist. And okay. let the market and, decide this. And, and the, on, on the second issue, the protection of biodiversity is part of what you do with your farming. So it can't be kept as a separate issue. It's at the heart of how you do your agriculture. And therefore, it's at the heart of how you deploy biotechnology. That's why we are saying, make your biosafety regulation stronger. Mm -hmm. Start removing the ignorance you have on ecological impact, because it's tremendous. And I'll give you a very simple example. The trials in India were started with a two meter isolation distance for preventing impact. And this was called containment distance. The data that Monsanto itself uses to sue farmers in the US if they're growing cotton is one mile away. In Arizona, they sued an organic cotton farmer who was growing organic okay, cotton. No, no, so no, uh, the, the difference is between two that. meters and one mile for pollination distances. And we need to get those basic facts of how much in genetic especially in today's context, where organic is the preferred alternative and certification of organic depends on, commi on absolutely committing yourself to be GE-free and co organic farmers will lose the option of having that label. Now we have to ask him to okay. respond. Yes. Sure. Uh, I, I on know two I issues, right? Yeah. On the same two issues. One is on profitability and the other is, you know, how can Look, you organize and, and the concerns that When it comes to profitability, she like she said, we, don't sh we shouldn't have one that she wants for cast telling farmers what is profitable and what is not. And you know, you know, what is important is the farmers can decide for themselves what is profitable. And and again, it is not true that uh, the market is rejecting outright. I believe in the power of market. And when you look at the fact in in Brazil this year, one million acres of this GM crop in soya bean was planted illegally by farmers, and they are not doing it without a reason because there is a, an increased element of profitability. It is it is there. And if it's not profitable, they are not going to grow. And it is as simple as that. Quickly, right. the, the second issue. Second organic, we can decide reject it outright. You know, organic not going to feed the world. Uh, we need about six billion cows to put all the manure for organic. And organic, there's always going to be a limited amount of market cows for are not people the only who source of organic. Well, whatever it is, you, when the plant grows, the draws some nutrients, you've got to put it back somewhere or other. And organics brings a higher incidence of E. coli. Outside Bangalore, we are growing vegetables and with human waste. And so it's very easy to sit here, somebody uh, to say that we, we, we can go organic. But in reality, it is, what we need is choice for the farmers. If farmer wants to go organic, let him do so. But it is a scientific intensive agriculture has helped uh, prevent millions of acres of farming uh, forestry land being brought under the flow and then uh, by green revolution and by increased mm -hmm. gene revolution we are going to uh, make sure that, uh, we, that uh, there's we, we, we have to, we have to cut you out we have run out of time that brings us to the end of this episode of crossfire where we discuss the introduction of genetically modified seeds into indian agriculture Dr. Vandana Shiva is of the opinion that this would be very harmful to Indian farmers and completely destroy the Indian biodiversity. Professor Prakash is of the view that the farmers should be allowed to decide for themselves and that the introduction of genetically modified seeds would be the next best thing after the Green Revolution in India. That's crossfire for you. Two different persons with militantly different views. Do send in your views on this program to crossfire at tvinonline.com. Until next week, same day, same time, good night. This program was sponsored by GE.